Hello, everyone from St. John's Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron, and I am an alumni engagement officer at Memorial and your host for today's event. I hope you are all well and safe as we live through and move forward through these very strange days. I'm here with Dr. Lisa Bishop, Dr. Jennifer Donnan, Dr. John Weber, and Sandy Brennan from the School of Pharmacy, and our topic today is cannabis. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge the territory in which Memorial St. John's campus is situated as the ancestral homelands of the Beotic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beotic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuhavut and the Innu of Nitasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all of the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honour this beautiful land together. Please also recognise the peoples and their ancestors whose ancestral homelands are those on which your own institutions are situated. At the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the world and are working diligently to create opportunities to celebrate, socialize, mentor, learn, and advance both your career and improve your life. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships is vital to our evolution as an institution. You, our alumni and friends, along with our faculty members, are our greatest ambassadors. Together, you encompass a worldwide community of professionals, leaders, and change makers who are advancing the reputation of our university, our province, and our world. Please consider getting involved with our programming. There are mentoring opportunities with 10,000 coffees, occasions to meet up with Newfoundland and Labrador expats through Global NL and Coastlines. Our online book club features Newfoundland and Labrador authors who are also Memorial alumni. You can find out more t details about all of these initiatives on our website, www.mun.ca slash alumni. Thank you for joining us today for our cannabis discussion in partnership with the School of Pharmacy. Our panel of experts, experts will be explaining the choices available to consumers, the different ways THC and CBD affect the body and offer guidelines for safe consumption. I am very excited to host and moderate today's event, and as indicated by the very large registration numbers, our audience is as well. Just a few housekeeping issues. For those new to WebEx, there is a layout button towards the top right-hand side of your screen that gives you options on how to view today's presentation. A Q&A will follow, and in regards to questions, our panelists will only be addressing questions submitted through either the chat or Q&A, so there won't be an option of unmuting and asking the question yourself. My colleague Sandy Brennan and I will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. Please try to keep your questions short, and I encourage you to post them as soon as possible. Don't leave them to the last minute. One note about content, our panelists are unable to provide medical advice for specific individuals. So please keep this in mind as well when posting questions. A final reminder that this session is being recorded and you will receive a link in a follow up email along with some additional resources and a PDF version of today's presentation. It is my very great pleasure to introduce our guests today. Dr. Lisa Bishop is a pharmacist and associate professor with the School of Pharmacy at Memorial University and is a clinical assistant professor with the discipline of family medicine. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from Memorial University, completed a hospital pharmacy residency program in Ontario, and earned a Doctor of Pharmacy degree through the University of Colorado. Her research interests are in the area of mental health, substance abuse, opioid stewardship, and cannabis. She is currently co-leading a cannabis policy evaluation project for Newfoundland and Labrador with the goal to determine how cannabis legalization has affected public health and safety. 
Dr. Jennifer Donnan is an assistant professor in the School of Pharmacy at Memorial University. She is a three time Memorial alumnus, having graduated with a BSc Pharmacy in 2005 and went on to complete graduate training in business administration, health technology assessment, and pharmacoepidemiology. Dr. Donnan is currently conducting research to evaluate cannabis policy at the provincial level, and she is examining consumer preferences for cannabis products at the national level. Her additional research interests include measuring and integrating patient preferences for healthcare interventions into clinical decision making. Dr. John T. Weber is a professor in the School of Pharmacy at Memorial University. He holds an MSc in Pharmaceutical Sciences from the University of Montana, a PhD in Pharmacology and Toxicology from the Medical College of Virginia, and completed postdoctoral research in Neurophysiology at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. He currently conducts research on the chemical constituents and biological activities of berries native to Newfoundland and Labrador, primarily using animal and cellular models. His other major area of interest focus is on the physiology and pathology of the cerebellum, an area of the brain associated with motor learning and coordination. This includes a research program studying the effects of adolescent binge alcohol exposure on long-term motor function. He has recently initiated research to evaluate the potential anti-inflammatory effects of various cannabinoids found in cannabis plants. He has given lectures regarding the effects of cannabis on the brain and behavior for many years. Dr. Weber has also served as an expert witness for several provincial and arbitration cases, which have included opinions on a variety of topics in neuro neuropharmacology, such as determination of blood alcohol content, the behavioral effects of ethanol, as well as the impairing effects of cannabis. Sandy Brennan holds a master's in sociology and will be getting her will be beginning her PhD this fall in pharmacy, focusing on cannabis education. Her research interests include public engagement, entrepreneurship, perceptions of risk, cannabis use, and education. Thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to speak to Memorial's alumni and friends today. And now, on with the presentation, and Dr. Weber is going to be kicking things off. So I'm going to pass control of the ball to Dr. Weber. And I'm going to... Okay, thanks, Janet. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks to all of you for your interest in, a, in attending the session today. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of interest. So um, I'm going to be giving just a brief introduction to about um, cannabis, what it is, some of the effects you may get from it. So what is cannabis? So a lot of you probably know that cannabis is a group of plants. Um, the main types of cannabis that are available are cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. There's also another uh, another species called cannabis ruderalis. So um, what you'll probably hear sometimes, and this is kind of subjective, this doesn't apply to everyone, is that cannabis sativa produces feelings of euphoria, sometimes can stimulate ind individuals or cause, you know, energy, for example, whereas cannabis indica is a bit different where you might get more sedation or muscle relaxation, maybe some effects on pain. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, and that's associated with indica couch, like couch link, because a lot of people feel so relaxed they can't get up off of their couch. Um, there's also compounds in these plants called terpenes, and those basically determine kind of the sense and the flavors of the different types of cannabis um, that you will find in Canada and elsewhere, for example. About the plants themselves, so on the left here, you see a picture of the leaves. So typically the sativa plants, they're a bit taller. They can grow up to 10 feet tall. Indica plants are, plants are a bit shorter, a bit more bushy, for example. And you see here the picture of the leaves, the, the leaves are a bit broader and a bit darker green. So those are the plants themselves. It's very rare to find a type of cannabis that is purely sativa or purely indica. They're almost all hybrids now. So through a lot of genetics, you can cross the plants and you'll get different hybrids. Some are sativa dominant, some are indica dominant, and some are well balanced. And based on this, you may get different types of effects based on the type of plant that you use. So the two main compounds that you're probably, most of you are probably familiar with are tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, and cannabidiol, which is CBD. And these are the two compounds that is necessary to, that you have to have the amounts or percentages of these compounds on any cannabis products in Canada. But there are many others that I'll talk about in a sec here. A bit more about the plant. So um, 
the term marijuana. So often the term marijuana is used in, you know, interchangeably with cannabis, but cannabis is the entire plant. Another term you'll hear is hemp as well. So hemp really refers to uh, the fibrous material that you can get from the stems, but aren't really psychoactive. But the term marijuana primarily refers to the flowers or the buds, uh, because those actually have the highest amount of THC and that's what's generally smoked. And of course, I just picked some images here that, you know, are associated with some of the stigma of marijuana over the, you know, decades and centuries. Actually, some of the other terms are used, weed, pot, reefer, et cetera. So one thing that's really interesting about cannabis plants is that they're dioecious. What that means is there are, there are female and male um, plants, and this is pretty rare in the, in the plant world. Because of that, they can be crossed, and that's why you can get all these different hybrids. Um, what is also interesting is that the female plants are what have the high levels of THC as well as the CBD, arguably, and the male plants really have very little THC, so they're not, they're not the desired plants, but of course they're needed for a lot of the genetic um, breeding. Um, again, the flowers and the buds have the very high amounts of THC, but also the trichomes, which are the hairs that are found on the flowering buds. There are crystals that are on the, that are found there that have high levels of THC as well and CBD. And basically that is the keef. If you extract that, that's called keef. And then if you kind of harden it um, a bit um, in a variety of ways, that is hashish. So, so there's, those are some of the types of products you'll, you'll come across as well. And those are typically the oils are made from that as well. So that's the basic information about the plants. And the cannabinoids I've mentioned, so these are the major compounds, at least the active compounds found in the plants. There's a, at least 140 of these that have been identified. Um, there's estimates actually up to about 160 of them. And the main ones, which I've already mentioned, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, that is the main psychoactive substance, uh, the main that will have most effects on behavior, and cannabidiol, CBD, are the two major ones. There's also cannabinol, CBN. There's other compounds like cannamochromine, CBC. And um, like I said, these are the major ones that are found in the plants. A lot of individuals that smoke cannabis, for example, versus um, say taking only THC, only CBD, may not get the same types of effects because there's something that is called an entourage effect that you may likely need more than just one compound from cannabis plants to get a desired effect, for example. And this would include the terpenes and the type of effects you get from terpenes as well. And as I mentioned, those are involved with like the flavors, the smells you get with various hybrids, but they also may have some, you know, act bioactive properties as well. So these are some basic effects of cannabis. And here I'm highlighting the effects of THC, as I mentioned, the major psychoactive substance. And if you were to smoke cannabis, and this graph here on the right shows how quickly you might get an effect. Typically within five to 10 minutes, if you smoke cannabis, uh, as long as there's a high enough THC content, you'll see some effects. And the effects typically will last between two to four, maybe even up to six hours. And I've listed here a few positive, neutral, and negative effects. Of course, this is subjective, but I think most people would think mood lift and relaxation are positive. A lot of individuals um, say it makes them think more creatively. It may help with writer's block or, you know, an artist paint, for example. A lot of just pleasant body feelings. And for some people, they report that it does decrease pain, depending on the type of pain, and it may reduce, reduce nausea. Neutral, of course, increase appetite. That could be good or bad. It depends what the desired effect is. So things like slowness and tiredness are not necessarily really bad effects, but they may be slightly negative for some people. You can get dryness of mouth and, and having a difficult time concentrating. Some negative effects, things like nausea, obviously the obvious, uh, I mean, sorry, opposite effect a lot of people have, but it can cause respiratory problems. You can get an increased heart rate. You could become anx anxious or agitated and get headaches and paranoia. And this is, of course, would be more typical, especially with first time or naive users, but it does happen in, in seasoned users as well. So those are the major effects of THC. Now, just some notes about CBD. If you were to ingest just CBD on its own, or a, say a very a, a type of cannabis that was very high in CBD, you may not have any noticeable effects, quite honestly. But there is there's pretty strong evidence now that CBD has some pretty good anti-inflammatory effects. But as far as being psychoactive, um, some individuals claim it helps with anxiety um, and depression. That data is we, the data is not strong enough. But for example, if that is true, then obviously if you're treating a symptom like anxiety, that's based in the central nervous system in the brain, and then you can make an argument that CBD is in fact a psychoactive substance. But without a doubt, THC is the major psychoactive substance. 
So how do these work? So we have cannabinoid receptors in the body, not just in the brain, but in a, in a variety of parts of the body as well. And, you know, why do we have these receptors? So I found this quote many years ago. So cannabinoid receptors are a gift from God and they allow us to respond to compounds found in cannabis plants and make us feel good because why else would we be able to find, we found this plant, we've smoked it, it makes us you know, feel good. These terms here, Amrita, that's a Hindi word and Ambrosia, that's a Greek Roman word, meaning potion of the immortals. A lot of users from centuries ago reported like distortions in time and we know that cannabis does this and even hallucinations in high doses. So clearly, you know, this must be some, some gift that God has given us, but that's not really the, the whole story. So we have a system in our body, it's called the endocannabinoid system. So endo meaning within, and the, this is basically the system that responds to the cannabinoids. And the reason this exists is because we have compounds in our body that just already exist and bind to these receptors. So those that are endogenous to animals like ourselves, so endogenous meaning within or naturally occurring within our bodies. Um, the first one listed there is anarachidonal and ethanolamide or anandamide. Anand is, um, uh, is a word that means uh, bliss or a state of well-being. It's from Sanskrit. Um, there's another one called 2-AG, 2-arachidonal glycerol, and, the, and a few others listed there as well. So they are naturally occurring on our bodies, and they bind to cannabinoid receptors in our bodies. And then, of course, you, you find THC, cannabidiol, and other can cannabinoids that are endogenous or naturally occurring in cannabis plants. So when we ingest them, they will bind to those receptors and cause a variety of effects, mainly mediated through these receptors. And there's a lot of synthetic um, compounds as well that have been produced over the past decades. Uh, the first one I listed there, S1141716A, um, was partially developed um, in a lab just down from me in Virginia. It's called Ramonavant, and that's actually blocks cannabinoid receptors and was um, tried out clinically to treat obesity, but it had a lot of side effects. And a lot of others there, you'll see that they just have numbers and letters by their names because that's typically when a pharmaceutical company is developing a compound, that's how they're named. And a lot of those compounds are actually even more potent than substances like THC. And most of those are typically used in experimental sense, but that's how we develop you know, new cannabinoids or new drugs in general. So where do you find receptors? So the main types of receptors are a cannabinoid are CB, so they're called CB receptors. There are CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors known for sure. And there may be even uh, CB type three and four receptors. So where do you find them? So I'm sure most of you aren't as familiar with the brain as I am. So the um, very high levels in various parts of the brain. So the basal ganglia is an area where you find a lot of these receptors, and that's an, an area involved with initiation of movement. Therefore, something like an indica, where you have lots of THC that you can't get off the couch, likely you're affecting that area of the brain. Cerebellum is an area of the brain involved with motor coordination that I do some research on, and your motor coordination can be altered um, because of effects in the cerebellum. The hippocampus is an area um, in, in this basic sense where you form new memories and that can be affected in some individuals um, that are smoking cannabis or using other products. The cerebral cortex has all sorts of functions that I can't go into, but things like, you know, your ability to concentrate, read, et cetera, and that can be affected positively or negatively. And then the brain stem, there's a lot of receptors there, and that's where you have the very basic effects in the body, things like um, effects on heart rate and respiration rate, and that's likely where you're getting some of those side effects because of binding there. There are also, as I mentioned, CB2 receptors. You do find these in the nervous system as well, but you find them really highly expressed on certain types of immune cells. So there, again, there is some evidence that CBD and, and potentially THC, but mainly CBD is an anti-inflammatory, and that is likely because it's activating those CB2 receptors on immune cells. There's also receptors found in the gut, in the area of the gut, and peripheral neurons, for example, um, even on, you know, on parts of your skin or neurons that um, innervate your skin area. So they're found in a lot of different areas. Um, so just a few more minutes here. Obviously, it's not all about smoking cannabis. That's the major way cannabis has been used over, again, decades and centuries. But now we have a lot of edibles and oils, for example. So here are just some examples like chocolates, as well as the, the gummy bears there that shows you, you know, how big or small they are. And, diff and, and oils with different concentrations of THC and CBD, for example. And I think it's important that everyone, you know, has a general idea of how these 
how these types of cannabis products could affect you. Um, so I mentioned, you know, briefly when I was talking about effects of THC, that if you smoke cannabis or if you vaporize it, of course, you can get you can get a cartridge for a vaporizer to ingest um, THC and CBD as well. So the onset's going to be within five to ten minutes, typically, and it's typically you're going to see effects for two to four hours, but it can last up to six hours. Um, if you take something orally, for example, like, you know, gummy bear, um, chocolate, et cetera, depending on, again, if you have any food in your stomach, et cetera, you'll get an onset between an, an hour, maybe to three hours, because that take, it takes time for that to be absorbed, for the compounds to be absorbed and basically get to the sites of action, get to those receptors and have effects. But you can, you can have an effect for six to eight hours. You might get a peak effect in two to four hours, but you could have lasting effects six to eight hours. And oral mucosal, that would be, for example, if you took like um, an oil, something like that under, under your tongue um, or in your mouth, um, it would, the onset would be slightly faster than if you say ate a gummy bear, it might be within 15 to 45 minutes, but the duration is very similar to if you took something orally, uh, typically lasts six to eight hours and might peak in two to four hours. Regular users can get tolerance to the effects of THC and likely to CBD. So that basically means over time, if you use these, these products a lot, you will need more of that product, more THC, more CBD to get the same effects. Um, but that's not true in all individuals, but definitely most, most drugs that affect this nervous system have that effect in general. And then just I'll end with, you know, potential negative effects. I've touched on some of them um, based on how much you smoke, the THC content, et cetera. You might get mild sensory distortions, you know, motor coordination, as I said, reaction time could be an issue where your reaction time is slowed, um, more difficulty concentrating and effects on memory, perception of time is, is often altered. It, you can get hallucinations in high doses. Um, and then there's things like, you know, depression, panic reactions, paranoid. These have been, these have been reported in some individuals. And um, of course you could stimulate appetite. It may have the opposite effect of that. And the data on, you know, does it can cannabis precipitate an underlying psychotic illness, like a disease, like say schizophrenia? That's debatable. There's still not enough strong data on that because we, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You know, is it someone that would have developed that type of a mental illness? Were they more prone to smoking cannabis or unique using cannabis, or is cannabis the trigger to that? It's it's an interesting uh, research question, and um, we still, you know, it's something that we need to answer with some more data. So I think I'm going to end there. Probably went over a few minutes, but I'm going to pass it on to, I believe, um, Jennifer now. Dr. Yes. Ronan. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. That was a really great um, overview. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and talk more about legalization and then what that means for the people who choose to use cannabis. Um, we can, do I have the slide? There we go. Um, so the first thing I thought I would do was really distinguish between legalization and decriminalization, because I think it's those terms are often used interchangeably, but certainly are not the same thing. So decriminalization refers to a loosening of criminal penalties for personal cannabis use and the possession of small amounts of cannabis. So being caught using cannabis could lead to civil fines, but not any criminal charges. However, the growth and sale of cannabis does remain um, illegal in this scenario. Legalization, however, allows for the possession and personal use of cannabis and allows for the government to regulate and tax sales. So that's, this is the difference. Um, uh, lots of people uh, believe that the Netherlands was like the first country to have legalized cannabis, but they actually operate under this decriminalized scenario or situation. So retail sales in some coffee shops is tolerated there, but the production and transportation and bulk possession is not. And so there's some benefits to this decriminalized scenario, and that's like there is a reduction on the strain on the criminal justice system, and therefore there is a cost savings to society. But the downside is that it doesn't allow for the regulation of the cannabis and the products therefore are never tested for say strength or contaminants, pesticides, things like that. And so there's really an unknown safety of the products that the end consumers are then using. So it, doesn't, it also doesn't create any revenue for government. And so all those economic benefits of the sales um, of cannabis are driven underground. 
So as we just heard, like cannabis is a very commonly used sus substance, and while it's not free from harm, it is considerably less risky than many other illicit substances. And so, therefore, Canada looked to legalize non-medical use of cannabis in 2018. And this was actually only the second country to do so. The first country to fully legalize cannabis was Uruguay, so not, not the Netherlands, as people often think. And the chief aim of legalization was to protect the health and safety of Canadians. And that really is only achievable if you have a legalized scenario, because if you can't regulate the product, you can't um, have any control over the protection of the health and safety of society. So while the Cannabis Act outlines uh, key regulations for non-medical cannabis use, so they, they highlight things like a minimum age, a quantity for possession, there's rules around packaging and warning labels and things like that. Each individual province actually um, had the ability to decide on how it was gonna roll out, how cannabis would be sold and enforced. So in this province, like many other provinces, we opted to mirror the minimum legal age for cannabis with that of alcohol. So here it's 19, but again, that's, different depending on the province and they didn't adjust the amount for possession so the maximum allowed, allowed um, amount the cannabis act allows is 30 grams and four plants for personal growth inside your property we're allowed to do that in this province but other provinces um, are not necessarily um, those same limits in terms of the cannabis sales um, Newfoundland and Labrador uses a mixed model so what that means is that the brick and mortar stores that you see, um, they're owned privately by individuals. And then the online stores run publicly by our provincial regulator. And this is actually different than all the other Atlantic provinces. So any, all the other Atlantic provinces have a completely private model or a completely public model, I should say. So their government regulator um, runs their brick and mortar stores as well as their online stores. And then there's different models right across the country, um, mixes of public and private. And in this province right now, we have 30 brick and mortar stores. Um, but as you can see from the map, there's definitely some geographic regions where there's no in-person access. And so those places will be limited to accessing through online sales only to purchase legal cannabis. Um, this picture though was changing and only a few months ago, you wouldn't have seen any points on the map, say on the Buren Peninsula. Well, there's still lots of gaps, especially in more rural and dispersed areas where maybe it's not always possible to um, to have, have a store um, that would, there'd be enough demand for a store in certain regions. Uh, but this is certainly highlighted a, a barrier to some people because while it's legalized and it's becoming more accepted, there's, there's still a prevailing stigma and people are still uncomfortable, say going in, going online and using a visa card and putting in their address and their age and all that personal information and tying that to their, um, to their cannabis purchase. So it has been uh, a barrier to some people. So in addition to the brick and mortar stores and the Newfoundland and Labrador online site, um, individuals also have the option to access medical cannabis if there's a medical indication for, for its use. But to do that, you need a medical cannabis document, which you get through a licensed um, you know, healthcare professional. And then that person, if once they have that document, can purchase through a licensed medical producer. So these people are often, or these companies are usually online um, you order and then it comes, gets shipped directly to your home. So for the medical cannabis users, there is an additional avenue to access legalized cannabis. Um, some people though struggle to find doctors who are comfortable providing medical documents. And that's just because the evidence is still really developing for cannabis use and medical purposes. There's not, um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, not along of that traditional, you know, medical evidence that we like to use to make decisions in the healthcare system. Uh, but there are medical professionals out there who specialize in supporting patients in their cannabis journey. So I know Dr. Norman, who I think is joining us today, um, she works with the Cannabo Clinic, and so she really helps people. There's also pain specialists and other individuals who might have specialized knowledge that can help people, but it is definitely a barrier to access for, for lots of people. The figure on the right, um, it's a little dated now, um, but it shows that the trends in both the legal and illegal cannabis sales in Canada. So at the, there's some more recent data that suggests that by the end of 2020, those lines have converged. So that means that the, both the legal and the illegal sales are about matched equal. But recent um, reports from the Newfoundland Labr uh, Labrador Liquor Corporation, um, they've indicated that there's reasons to believe that in this province, 
the legal market only makes up about 30 to 40 percent. So still more than half of the cannabis market is through illegal sales. And I want to point out that while some people are really aware that when they purchase cannabis, uh, they're purchasing from an illegal market, there's a lot of people that may be totally unaware that what they're buying is not actually a licensed product. So there are brick and mortar stores that might appear or assume to be legal businesses, but have not been regulated by, um, you know, have been not licensed to sell cannabis. And likewise, there's many websites that really look legitimate. They use typical payment mechanisms and they ship, you know, through Canada Post. However, the only website that you can order cannabis from legally from Newfoundland and Labrador is the Shop Cannabis NL site, and that's for non-medical use. Like I said, there are there are medical use websites you can use. Um, and so I know the NLC has been putting a push out for, like public education campaign. And so they've they say, if you see this logo, then, you know, it's a, a legalized um, source of cannabis. Uh, when we look at consumption patterns for cannabis, uh, a few years ago, Newfoundland actually had the second highest rate of consumption across the country, second only to Nova Scotia. However, in more recent national surveys, consumption patterns have tended to what you see here is leveled out or averaged out with the exception of Quebec, which seems to have much lower rates um, than the rest of the country. And when we look at the types of products people tend to use, the vast majority is still dried flour, but there's so many new products that have been hitting the shelves at a really rapid pace, especially in the last year, since those um, edibles and other types of products have been um, have started to become regulated. This, I think this is a dynamic figures and those numbers are certainly changing. Um, there's still confusion, I think, around where it's legal uh, to use cannabis and the rules are actually quite restrictive. So technically, you're only allowed to consume cannabis in your own home. It cannot be used in a car, and that's whether or not you're the driver or a passenger. It can't be used in public spaces or bars, and it can't be used in uh, rented dwellings like apartments or hotel rooms unless it's explicitly stated by the owner that that's permitted. So this also creates a really big barrier to access for some people, because if you don't own your own home, there's actually no legal place that you can consume cannabis products. And I think it's really important to note here that when the cannabis policies and regulations were designed, um, it was really a concerted effort to ensure that they started out very conservatively because, you know, you can, it's really difficult to roll back policies once they've been in place. Uh, it's much easier to relax restrictions once we know how we can do that appropriately. And so that's a, a big part of the research that we've been doing in terms of a cannabis policy evaluation um, is we're going out and talking to stakeholders and people in the community to try to understand the impact of these policies and how we might be able to refine those or make recommendations to refine those that not only you know meet consumer needs, but also support um, government goals in terms of what they were trying to achieve with cannabis legalization. Um, driving is also another point of confusion. So I just wanted to highlight, I already mentioned that it's not legal to consume in a car and like alcohol, it has to be stored in a sealed package and out of reach of the driver. Also like alcohol, there is a threshold for how much cannabis can be in your blood and what's considered acceptable. However, it is really quite low. And having this value is really just accounts for the fact that cannabis remains in your system for quite a long period of time. And there are still detectable levels even once someone is no longer impaired. So that's kind of the reason for that. But there is zero tolerance for any cannabis in the blood for individuals who are novice drivers, if they're under 22, or if they are commercial drivers. And when you look at Health Canada recommendations, and, and John alluded to this already, is, you know, you know, you should really wait six hours because really the duration of um, the, how long the, the effect can last for some of these products is about six hours. Uh, so you should wait six hours before driving. But if you're taking an edible product, <clears throat> then that time should increase to about eight hours because that takes longer to take effect and to wear off. And there are certainly penalties for people who are caught um, with blood concentrations of uh, cannabis. So if I think it's between two and five nanograms of THC, um, they get a maximum fine of a thousand. If there's over five milligram or five nanograms of THC, um, there's a mandatory fine. And then if there's a second and third offense, there's actually prison time for that. So there are certainly um, implications for people who are caught uh, driving with blood up, uh, cannabis levels. 
And again, I just wanted to highlight that like places of consumption, the policies and regulations around driving are conservative and we're still learning lots about them. So there's lots we need to know about how to accurately measure impairment because it's not always about the blood cannabis level. Um, so we've heard from medical cannabis consumers, for example, who require the use of cannabis at regular intervals throughout the day. And that would put them always at a blood cannabis level that exceeds the limit. Um, however, you know, they might have developed a tolerance, you know, like we talked about earlier, and that level of impairment might not be the same for someone who consumes uh, occasionally. And so there's lots of ongoing discussions about how to best measure impaired drivers, um, but, but we're not there yet. So I will end there and pass um, the mic over to Lisa. Great. Well, thanks, Jennifer. Lots of great information. There's a lot we want to cover with you today, but not a lot of time. So I'm just going to highlight a few of the side effects of cannabis. John already went through a lot of them that have the impact on the brain, but there's some other side effects that we need to think about. One in particular is if you're smoking cannabis and because you're burning and smoking, there are a lot of toxic chemicals. And as a result, you can get lung problems as well as heart problems as well. So that's something that that's encouraged to not smoke if at all possible and use other methods of consumption. And there are some other more, uh, I guess, less common or, or unexpected side effects like uncontrollable vomiting and muscle twist, twitching, those kinds of things that can occur as well. And it's, there's a few situations where it's recommended to avoid cannabis. Of course, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding because of the effects that you can have on the baby. John alluded to the point about cannabis potentially worsening psychosis, so that's a concern. And generally speaking, if people have a mood disorder or psychiatric disorders or family history of psychosis, it's recommended to not use cannabis because it increases your chance of developing psychosis. And as well, if you're under the age of 25, your brain is still developing. So cannabis can have a greater effect, and in particular in the adolescence years. So less than 16 is really recommended to try and avoid cannabis if at all possible because of the, the effects on the developing brain. And cannabis can cause dependence or addiction, so that's something that you also need to think about, especially with frequent uh, use. So in terms of medical use of cannabis, Jennifer talked about this a little bit, and there's some evidence that suggests that yes, there's a role for cannabis, and then it's still evolving in terms of well, what, where are the, where's the most evidence? So what's the best evidence for using cannabis, whether it's beneficial or it's not beneficial? And these are just a couple little snippets of other resources that I have here that outline some of the potential places where cannabis does have some effect, like people with chronic nerve pain for nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy, those kinds of things. And like Jennifer mentioned, there are some specialists who know a lot more about cannabis and can help guide people in terms of, well, is this the best fit for that particular individual based on their medical history and the risk benefit of using medical cannabis. And I know over the years we will, as time goes on, find out a lot more and, and have a clearer picture as we get more evidence for this. So Jennifer also mentioned about the access to medical cannabis. So I have here the website. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about the forms and the process of obtaining medical cannabis, that website is there. Oh, sorry, I forgot to advance the slide. The website is there right on the top. And the, I guess the top three are when you're purchasing from actual medical suppliers. So either a licensed seller, you can produce a limited amount for your own use, or you can designate someone else to produce medical supply for you. 
However, you can also purchase the non-medical supply for medical purposes through your authorized retail outlets or through the NLC here in this province. And one of the biggest differences is in the amount that you can carry on your person when you're in public. So if you have a medical indication and you have medical documentation to support that, then you can actually carry more in public versus someone who is just using it for non-medical purposes. Because we know there's a lot of people out there who are still using cannabis for medical reasons, but may, may not have the medical documentation, but are just purchasing the non medical supply. So that's a, a couple little differences. But that website does outline all the, the different ways of purchasing and the regulations around that. So I want to spend a, a couple minutes talking about this, the lower risk cannabis use guidelines. So this is a, a great document because it goes through suggestions of how people can minimize their health risks. The main goal of cannabis legalization was to protect public health and safety. And we know that cannabis does have some health risks and there are safer ways of using cannabis to help lower your risk of um, health concerns. So these are here in the little summary, but there's more information you can Google and, and find the more detailed document. So the the first thing is obvious. If you abstain, then you can avoid risks altogether. The next one is around delaying and later in life. And that's referring to the point about the developing brain. And especially in adolescence before age 16, you really want to avoid it because it can have an effect on the the developing brain. Using those lower risk products like products that have lower THC because a lot of these side effects are related to the THC content. So choosing those lower concentrated products of THC is, is recommended. The synthetic cannabinoids like your um, your K2 and spice, those kinds of things have more serious side effects than natural cannabis. So generally speaking, it's recommended to avoid those. And like I mentioned before, you, smoking cannabis has those toxic chemicals. So it's a good idea to avoid that. Try and use other forms of cannabis, such as edibles, as well as vaping, although vaping has some crushable uh, toxic effects as well in the vaping related illnesses that can occur. And for those who do choose to smoke cannabis, avoiding those harmful practices like deep in inhalation and breath holding, because that's really getting more of those toxic chemicals in your lungs. And limiting the amount or how often you use it, use it more frequently, has more negative health effects, more social effects, more dependence. So that's why we want to try and limit how much you use, like just uh, sticking to weekends, for instance. Avoiding it when you're driving, like Jennifer went through because of impairment. And avoid combining risks. So if you have multiple risk factors, obviously if you have many of those, then that increases the chance so of health consequences. And as well, avoiding tobacco and alcohol concurrently when you're using cannabis as well. So those kinds of things. And a lot of these are common sense, but it's nice to see all of those together when, when people do use cannabis, just like we do with alcohol, sex education, all those kinds of things. It's all about safer use and, and making uh, safer choices. And just uh, to finish off, I just wanted to highlight some youth and family resources. So now that we're in a, a legalized world, many of us grew up in an environment when cannabis was not legal and even being comfortable talking to our children about that is can be challenging. So there's some great resources available. Some of them I have posted there. And it's really about having those open, non-judgmental conversations with youth and focusing on some of those harm reduction principles or those lower risk use guidelines like we mentioned earlier when we're having those conversations. So we know youth experiment, 
So really having those conversations. Well, if, if you choose to use, use it more safer. And we have those links to some of these resources posted on our website. So our website is outlined there and we do have a section for resources. So those plus there's other resources there for more information. So with that, we will now open up for questions. So thanks all for listening. Thank you everyone for your uh, amazing information. Uh, I'm just going to clear the screen so we can see everyone's faces. And we're gonna have a little chat. We've got lots of questions. And um, our panel has graciously suggest, said that they can stay a little bit longer uh, after one o'clock. So for those who are at, uh, watching and have to leave at one, remember we are recording, so um, you don't have to feel like you have to, uh, that you're gonna miss something, um, but we're gonna dive right into the Q&A right now with no further ado. So um, we've got these organized. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with a question for Dr. Weber. Um, we have a question from Adrian who's asking, are there health issues for the lungs with smoking cannabis? Yeah, so I think, I think Lisa, Dr. Bishop uh, alluded to that a bit. So I think, you know, if you think about um, smoking tobacco as well, like the smoke has a lot of compounds in it that really are bad for lung tissue. So if possible, yes, like something like edibles or um, oils, et cetera, could be better because you wouldn't have as adverse effects on the lungs. That being said, of course, it's gonna depend on the amount you smoke. Like if you have one joint a day, it may cause very minimal effects. If you're having several a day, then there's pro likely will be pretty obvious effects because you're affecting the, the lung tissue directly because a lot of the toxic stuff in the, in the smoke, but it could be affecting immune cells as well and damping the immune system in the lungs. So certainly there are some potential um, adverse health effects with smoking cannabis versus not. Sandy's got a question now for Lisa. Uh, actually, I'm going to, I'd like to uh, do a bit of a follow-up question there. Um, so, uh, so Lisa had mentioned uh, some of the issues around vaping and um, uh, John and Lisa had mentioned some of the um, potential issues with combustion, but we had a question from Bob about the effects of dry herb vaporizers versus smoking. So. Uh, vaping can be using cartridges or liquid, but you can also use vaporizers that just use flour. So um, I'm not sure, John or Lisa, if one of you might be able to address that. You want to talk about that, Lisa? Do you, do you know? I mean, burning through smoking is the most harmful because it has those toxic chemicals. Yes. And I'm not sure with the, the vaping because you're not burning it. So I would assume that it's not as harmful. Would you agree, John? Yeah, so va vaping overall is not as harmful. No. Yeah, so, and I think, oh, I see <laughs> Alia Norman just posted in there that, that uh, she could comment on that. I yeah, think, if we, except, if we I don't to. know if she can, can she speak? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, we could um, allow her to speak. Sorry, who was that? I missed that. Dr. Uh, Dr. Alia Norman. I, I'm pretty sure I saw her. Yep, I see her and I can, I think, let's just see if I can do this. I think I can unmute her. Um, could we ask another question though, Sandy? And I'll see if I can uh, unmute um, Alia. Sure thing. Um, Jennifer, uh, Stephen asks, is there any difference between medical and recreational cannabis other than medical may be covered by an insurance plan? Um, that's an actually interesting question. So they are, there are different rules on how they can be um, produced. So they, and the, the difference in gamma radiation, and there's different, I think, lists of pesticides that can be used. So there are certainly some differences, I think. Um, so it is not just as simple as um, just buying the same products either through a medical provider or a, or a, a non-medical provider. Um, I'm having difficulty unmuting Ali. I'm sorry. So um, we're going to go to a question for who are we going to now, uh, Sandy? For Lisa? Yes. Um, we've got a question from Shelly asking: Is there evidence that medical cannabis is effective in treating arthritis? So, in terms of, 
I guess the medical questions in general, we encourage you to speak to your medical providers because every person is different in terms of looking at what's best for them. So we don't want to get into too many specifics, but I mean, generally speaking, there's not as much evidence for arthritis as some other pain type of conditions. In terms of pain in particular, it's more of the the neuropathic or nerve pain, there has more evidence. But again, we encourage you to speak to your healthcare providers and even get referrals to practitioners who do work in medical cannabis, essentially, like Dr. Norman, who we're trying to unmute. And <laughs> you can either get a referral directly through a healthcare provider or people can self-refer as well. So that's another option that patients can directly self-refer. I can, I can further comment on that as to the scientific evidence where it stands now and why cannabinoids may be useful for arthritis is um, obviously that's, that's a, you know, syndrome or, or disease where you have inflammation in the joints. And so if, and I know so there's ongoing studies in this, like obviously I mentioned about how CBD may may act as an anti-inflammatory. So if you were to, for just as an example, use a topical application in joints, and if you had enough absorption and the CBD was in fact inhibiting the, um, the inflammatory response in the joints, then, you know, you could you could suggest that it may work, but that being said, we just we haven't had the controlled studies to know for sure if it works. But it, I mean, the I mean, knowing the mechanism of action, it's possible that um, these compounds could potentially be useful for arthritis. Okay, um, who's the next question for Sandy? Uh, I think we'll go to Jennifer next. Um, so we had Ed ask, as a person who's never consumed cannabis in any form, I'm interested in learning more about CBD for its medicinal purposes. Is there a stigma surrounding that aspect of cannabis as there used to be, or maybe still is towards potheads? Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely lots of resources out there in terms of people who've never used cannabis and getting some information for medical use, just like you know Lisa said, um, you definitely want to talk to your medical professional because I think for the biggest thing is that if you're using substances to treat medical conditions, um, you know, you want your medical provider, your doctor to be able to look at that in terms of the whole spectrum of um, your treatment and care. And so I think it's important that we're not, people aren't doing that outside of the knowledge of their healthcare professional. In terms of the stigma, um, I would say in terms of CBD, there's probably a lot less stigma, but stigma in general is changing. So it's evolving. We're seeing, you know, people becoming more uh, accepting and the mindset of the community changing. And so I think um, it's probably looked at or perceived differently than, um, you know, traditionally smoking cannabis. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an evolving situation. So. Uh, we've got a question from for John from Karina, who's wondering about SSRI patients and cannabis consumption. What are the interactions, risks, and safe consumption recommendations in that case? That's something I don't think I should comment on because that's okay, like, that's that's enough. medical advice. That's pretty specific. That I don't I don't feel qualified as a basic scientist to really co comment on that. But uh, okay, here's another that's question you'd that have you... to talk to a physician about directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's a question. Do the newer sublingual tin, tin slips in brackets emblem, maybe that's a brand name, have a duration of effect similar to the other oromus oromuscular forms of cannabis? Yep, as far as we understand now, it's it's within that line of the, the one slide I had about the duration of action. So, you know, I talked about, yeah, you probably, you may get uptake or absorption within 15, 45 minutes, something like that. And it may peak an hour or two after. Um, in some individuals, there may be only noticeable effects for you know four or five hours, but it could potentially have a duration of action of eight hours. That's the issue with like cannabinoids in general are very say fat soluble. They stick around in fat tissue. They can absorb quickly and they stick around for a long time. So I would suggest that those types of products are very similar to any of the other oral mucos uh, mucosal types of products that are out there. Great. I think we have a question now for Lisa. Uh, Lisa, you had spoken a little bit about um, in terms of lower risk use guidelines, and we had a question on what evidence is there on the harms of using during pregnancy or breastfeeding? 
No, that, that's a great question. And that's something we were looking at more recently. And there seems to be both short term and long term risks of using cannabis when pregnant. And some of the short term risks are the low birth weight of the baby, uh, neonatal ICU stay. And then some of the long term health concerns are some psychotic like experiences for the child, depression, and some issues with some of those executive functioning um, performances. So they're the things that the evidence seems to point to. And again, it's more challenging to do research in the pregnant population because you can't just, you know, put them in an experiment and test it. But it's really more that, you know, kind of looking back in time and looking at the outcomes of those babies and of those moms who have used cannabis. So, you know, that's for sure an evolving um, piece of evidence that we'll find out more as time goes on and there's more use of cannabis. But they, yeah, there there seems to be based on current evidence that there are some potentially short term and long term consequences for the baby. Question now for Jennifer. Um, are there any commercial cannabis growers in Newfoundland and Labrador? There are. Um... I know there's a few around. I, I I don't want to miss any of them, but there are definitely some craft producers within the province um, that we've been collaborating with. But I wouldn't want to promote any one single one. But <laughs> Good to know they're, they're out there, though. Yeah, they're definitely out there, and we're not just getting cannabis from the like the national mass producers anymore. Yeah. I think our next question is for Lisa. Um, Lisa, you had you had presented some information on which um, conditions that it's often tended to be prescribed for. Uh, is it harder to get approved for medical use if it is being used to treat an anxiety disorder? Oh, I don't know. It's, I think it's dependent on the individual situation of that person. So really, Cannabis isn't typically used first line for any conditions. Usually it's kind of the, the traditional therapies that are used and you have discussions with your family doctor, your specialist, and that's when you kind of get to those discussions of, well, is cannabis uh, a right fit for that individual person? So whether it's going to get approved or not, it's, it's kind of hard to say without knowing more information. But again, this is where you have specialists who work in this area frequently who can kind of have those discussions with the patient and what they tried before and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, it's it's a little bit hard to answer that question without knowing more. Um, question for Jennifer, uh, can you legally order cannabis from a different province or are you restricted to your own province? Uh, this person is lives in the Northwest Territories and they don't have a place to order legally online there. Oh, interesting. Um, no, like it is true. You do have to, it. It's provincially regulated how cannabis is sold, um, and so you are limited to what is legalized within that province. So here, in Newfoundland, and Labrador, if you want to order online, it's only the Shop Cannabis NL, or if you have a you know a medical document, then there are a few other places that you can shop from as well. Um, so it's interesting in the Northwest Territories that maybe there isn't access, and I'm not sure offhand if there's like a special um, allowance for them to order from somewhere different. That's probably something I should look into. But um, generally speaking, if you're ordering online, make sure you're shopping from your provincial um, approved store. And I think that's really um, not common knowledge to people because we heard from lots of people ordering from lots of different provinces and the sites looked very legitimate. Um, you know, they asked for their age, you know, there, there might be some warnings and things like that. And so it looks like it's maybe a regulated product, but it isn't so. Right. Great question. Our next question is for John. Um, I've heard that CBD works best with small levels of THC, for example, a one to four ratio. Is this true? Well, it, de it depends like what the goal is there again, but like um, I talked about the entourage effect. So in some ways you may need more than one cannabinoid depending on what you're trying to achieve. So but if, you, if you're trying to get the benefits of CBD, for example, at least reported benefits potentially of something like an anti-inflammatory effect, or again, this, this data is not strong, but some individuals have suggested that it could be useful for treating anxiety, for example. 
uh, then you would want a higher CBD content versus a, in, in a very low THC content. So if those are the goals, and certainly, um, again, sometimes people use CBD for because it, it can cause drowsiness, for example. Um, THC can also do that, but it may do the opposite. So if you if that was the goal too, if you want for sleep, then yes, the higher the CBD and lower the THC, the the better. But that being said, the one to four ratio, um, it's not a golden rule because every these things affect everyone differently. So again, it, it depends on what what the goals of the individual are. So I guess that's probably the the way I would answer it in a general sense. Great. Uh, question for Jennifer. Uh, there was mention of oral products, but no mention of topicals. We've seen topical products in Europe. Can such products be brought into Canada for personal use? So topical products, that was something that was legalized in October 2019. So in 2018, it was just mostly the dried uh, flower products. And then in 2019, edibles um, and certainly topicals and things like that were, were brought on board. Um, so they are available in Canada now. And I think early in, you know, when it was first legalized in 2019, they're just, the products weren't approved for sale yet. So even though it's legal, products still have to go through the regulatory process. So they're not, they weren't actually hitting the shelves till probably early 2020. So they are available here in Canada now. In terms of bringing it in from other places, I still don't think that would meet, um, you know, Canadian regulations in terms of bringing it in from other countries for sure. You would still have to purchase it through the, the regular mechanisms in your province. Um, Jennifer, we have another question. What are the differences between vaping distillate from a Health Canada regulated licensed producer as opposed to an illicit market vape and are the risks similar? And that's a, a tough one because you really don't know what you're going to find in something from the uh, unlicensed market in terms of a vape product. I mean, we've heard lots of issues around, you know, this, you know, vaping, like vaping disease that people are coming down with and being hospitalized with, and they still don't really know what the cause of that is. There's some speculations around maybe certain vitamins or additives, um, but I don't know if we have a concrete answer on that. And so, um, there's definitely, there's a lot of uncertainty about what you're going to get in the unlicensed market versus what you're going to get in the regulated market. And I think that's why even in the regulated market, um, we're seeing a slow um, approval process for vaping distillates because we're still just unsure of how safe they are. So in some provinces, they're still not even available. Um, so it's a hard question to answer until we know really what the problem is. But certainly, if you're buying it from the unlicensed market, there's there's potential for lots of other, lots of things in it that that we Lots of unknown substances in that product. Uh, we've got a just a couple more questions, I think. Um, someone had asked a question and then basically it was answered that smoking is, is probably the most harmful form. Uh, this woman's daughter smokes every night. It has been a sore spot for us. I do not want her smoking it at all. Uh, what is the form I should, 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 should suggest she tries? Well, that's, that's a great question. It is, a, is good question. A, a good question. I mean, the edibles are the safest, right? Because I mean, smoking we know has those toxic toxic chemicals. Vaping has the vaping related illness potentially that can cause damage to the lungs. So I mean, edibles would be on the the surface kind of the, the safer option. But I would also encourage you to look at some of those resources that we have posted on our website that talk about how to talk to youth about cannabis, you know, how to minimize the harms, you know, even if she chooses to smoke, you know, not doing that deep inhalation or, or breath holding, you know, some of those techniques, even trying to cut down the amount, like all those kinds of things. I think there's some great suggestions there of one, how to have those conversations, but also some suggestions about how to minimize the the risk. But I mean, most obviously an edible would be a safer form that um, if she's willing to try. Right. Okay. So if she's willing. A bit on that as well. Yeah. It's, it's just, again, it's what, you know, what is the desired effect? For example, like a major reason that people smoke cannabis, um, all those effects I talked about, which are beneficial, but it has a very quick onset of action. So if someone, for example, is feeling depressed and they want to feel better, if someone uh, wants to go to sleep and they're just trying to feel drowsy, yes, they smoke because they might get the effects in five to 10 minutes. So if 
if, for example, it's something where it helps you get to sleep, an edible may do the same thing, but you have to know to take it, you know, an hour, two hours before you went to sleep. For uh, these are examples, right? So if this is an individual that is like using it because they want to feel better and they want to feel better quickly, then maybe you know an option could then be a vaporizer versus smoking it. But if it's something where the, the individual is okay to have a delayed effect, then yes, obviously, like like Lisa said, then an edible be would be a better choice. So it all has to be, you know, it's about the desired effects too that an individual is seeking. Yeah. And and one of the points I forgot to mention is is um see if she's using legal supply or the unlicensed supply. Because at least with the legal supply, it's more regulated and you know exactly what you're getting versus it could be, you know, different concentrations or other things in the illegal supply. So that's another suggestion as well. Yeah. And for anyone well, who wants Oh, if I Sorry, could just, ahead, Sandy. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I was back and forth between the questions. So this may have been said, if it is, I apologize. But uh, when we talk about using edibles as a lower risk route of administration, it's super important to remember to start low and go slow. So if someone yes. is a very, even a very experienced cannabis user, um, if you're trying an edible for the first time, please don't <laughs> try to be a hero and take a very high dose because it can, uh, it's probably a lot more likely to lead to some of those negative effects that we talked about earlier. Um, so start low and go slow is always a good guideline uh, when it comes to, well, any method of administration, but I think edibles, I definitely wanted to, to mention that there. Okay. So uh, I would really sincerely like to thank all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Bishop, Dr. Donnan, and Dr. Weber for their time and for sharing their expertise with us. And I'd like to thank Sandy for her help with the Q&A. I'm sure we've all learned a lot today. I know I have. Uh, and thank you to all of you out there for attending and for your great questions. If you enjoyed today's event, please check out our alumni uh, website for upcoming events. And as I indicated earlier, this session has been recorded and we will be sharing a link in an upcoming email. So uh, please keep your eyes on your inbox. Um, so with that, I am going to end the recording and thank you all for attending. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. 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 <laughs>